So a few weeks ago, a friend of mine, who, like, as I said, was from non Mennonite, non Anabaptist background, she told me, she said, you know, something I've noticed, she's come into the Anabaptist church a number of years ago as a young woman, and she's now married with children, and she said, I've noticed in the Anabaptist world, the Anabaptist people like to have formulas to follow, and they like to have lists to check off. Do what I tell you, go from point A to point B, and you will have this success, so this, it'll work out this way for you. But she said, that's not how it works in the kingdom of God. Their formulas aren't a bad thing and checklists aren't a bad thing, but God steps outside our comfort zone. He pushes us outside our comfort zone many times. And if I was able today to give you a piece of paper and I would have each, it numbered off, do these things as you raise your children in an urban environment and you are guaranteed strong, godly children. I wish I could do that. I wish someone would give me a list like that. But we have the Bible and we have the Holy Spirit. And I think God uses our children to humble us and to keep us focused on him. This is about him. This is not about my children making me look good. It is not about how well behaved they are so I can show people how well I parent or how good of a Christian and Jesus follower I am. This is about me walking in humility with a very close and personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And that when I fail and when I mess up, by the grace of God, I get back up. And in his mercy and love, he forgives me and gives me courage to move on. And that is what I want to do to my children because our children are going to mess up. They're sons of Adam, just like we are. And they're going to mess up. I have a water, Emily, right? Yes. I was going to bring it up. Thank you. I think living urban for a little over five years has made me a little less confident instead of more confident. Three years ago, I would have probably had a few more answers. And then we moved. And like I said, God has a way of allowing us to get into situations that keep us humble and focused on him. I feel like especially the, the teen years are really challenging. They're really challenging no matter where you live, but you move into the city with a small space and they get a lot harder. Um, I'm not afraid so much of them getting into um, bad company because that can happen in the country, as we all know. We all have, I'm sure, know of situations where uh, loved ones have made really bad choices living in the middle of nowhere. Um, but because children need a purpose, and no matter where you live, you need to give your children a reason to feel needed, to feel wanted, to feel like they have something to give, the family or something to give people. Um, Boys especially, of which I have 10, for those of you who didn't figure that out by now, need to play hard and work hard and as they hit those teen years of puberty and rising testosterone levels. I love my boys. I love my daughter, too. But I tell the Lord, if you were going to call me to urban living, you could have given me 10 daughters, maybe. <laughs> I could have done it. I don't know. If sewing business, well, I don't sew. I don't really garden either, so we would have figured something out. But God didn't. He gave me 10 boys, and that's not coincidental. When I got born again 20 years ago, I gave everything to Christ. I was a mess. My life was a wreck. I couldn't believe that Jesus wanted me the greatest. I felt like the greatest of all sinners. And I came to him at the bottom of my life, and he transformed me. And that's when I said, you know what? He's done everything for me. The least I can do is say, here's my life. And I want you to take it. And I want you to bring something out of it, whatever that is. I'll serve wherever I'll go anywhere and I'll do anything. How little I know, right? I'm going to give a little background story of how we got into urban living. And at the end, I would really love to open it up and have a time of discussion or questions or whatever. And I know it's hard for us as women to use our voices in a public setting. But I would encourage you to um, think about things that you would like to talk about or questions that you would have as I'm speaking. And I really want to hear what's on your heart. So, like I mentioned, we got born again. And as my husband mentioned this morning, he did a work in our heart towards having children. About every 18 months, 24 months, another little weaver would show up, boy after boy. And there came a time in our, our life where my husband said, you know, he was working in corporate America, and he said, I have the rest of my life to work in a corporate America. But he said, I only have a short amount of time to work with my boys. And um, he said, I 
you often hear older men say, I wish I would have spent more time with my children. He said, you never hear any of them say, I spent too much time with my children. I wish I would have spent more time at the office. So when child number, well, the twins came along, and that was boys number five and, no, four and, four and five. We had six children. Um, my husband said, all right, it's time to take this plan into the next level. And we ended up moving onto my parents' home farm. 60 acres, not far from here, about 40 minutes from here, maybe. My, uh, the area where I grew up, never wanted to live there after I left, but that's where God took us. You know how he has a way of doing that. Never say you never, never say you'll never live somewhere because I've said that a few times and I live in pretty much all of those places. <laughs> so we lived on the 60 acre farm, right? We milked cows, raised pastured chickens, mostly which were eaten by hawks. And the best part, there was an endless amount of work for my boys to do. They worked hard, they played hard, they would hit the bed at night exhausted. Daddy was home all day, every day. And um, <clears throat> I used to look over the farm. I remember one night looking over the farm, there was a storm moving in. It actually ended up being the night that I think a tornado took our barn out, but I didn't know that yet. And I'm looking out over, Marlon's coming in over the yard with his crew of boys. And I remember just going like, this is how it's supposed to be. I love this. My boys, their daddy, on the farm. I'm not even a farmer's person. I mean, I don't even like farms all that much, but it was amazing. It was like the workload on my shoulders was easier because Marlon was home all day, every day with the boys. Um, unfortunately, none of my boys have that vision for farm life. They remember the four o'clock wake up calls in the morning. Um, and my husband says that the farm was God's way of showing him he was not cut out to be a dairy farmer. <laughs> the stress was really intense. And um, <clears throat> I guess the question is, how, if that was our vision for our family and that was our dream, how did we end up urban living? What kind of crazy took over that made us want to take a house full of males and cram them into an apartment and think that's a good idea? I can assure you, pretty much every one of my family was thinking the same, and some of them let us know that too. <clears throat> so <clears throat> we're on the farm, right? After a couple years, we realized that the cow situation was just not working out. I won't even go into that. It was a time of sanctification and refinement. God can even use cows, and he used it. We were sanctified, and we finally said, enough of this. The cows have to go. Sold the cows, and finally, we were seeing the tiny beginnings of maybe some financial success on the farm. And we thought, now we can truly make this a working family farm um, where we can actually survive financially. But there was a little problem. I started having this nagging sentiment that God was calling us to something else. So for the first two years on the farm, one of the other reasons we moved to the farm was to take care of my mother. She, at the age of around 54, 55, we realized something was wrong. And she suffered for about nine years with early onset Alzheimer's. And it was never officially diagnosed, but it followed somewhat of that pattern. And my mom needed full-time care, and my dad was still working full-time, and there was no one else in the family that was able to take care of her. And so we felt like this was God calling us home to honor our parents, to take care of my mother, and, um, and to work as a family. And one thing that we had committed to in our hearts, and that was, we will never leave the farm until my mother passes away. Um, I remember moving there, and I cried the whole way to the farm that day that we moved there, because it was hard for me to surrender. Um, I loved my mom. I had a good relationship with her, but to be there, and this was uh, about six years into her illness, um, she still was able to communicate somewhat. She still knew who I was, and, and um, my dad was building a little dolly house, uh, I'm sure my grandfather's house there in the yard beside us, and he would bring my mom in about 6.30 in the morning, and he, he would, she would say, oh, Darla, I'm so glad you're here. And I would be like, Mom, me too. Well, she passed away uh, two-ish years into, two and a half years into our farm life, and um, we sold the cows shortly after, and I just started getting this really uneasy feeling that God was calling us to something else. And I would, I, there were times I was just so overwhelmed, I would lay my head on my arms and I would go, God, what are you trying to tell me? 
what are you trying to tell us? And I, first I was like, well, you know, hormones, that time of the month. You know, probably it's just me, it's in my imagination, but I just didn't feel at peace anymore. Something was just happening in my heart. Well, when mom started coming to me and saying, I feel like God is calling us to something else, but I don't know what that is. I knew it wasn't female hormones. I knew it was the Holy Spirit working because that is God's heart if you're married, is for your, the husband and wife to work together beautifully. It doesn't mean you always agree on everything, but it means that his heart is as you talk through things and you process that he brings your heart together as a couple. And we both were like, what, what are we here for? Um, ever since we had gotten saved, we made um, intentional discipleship a, a, a focus of our lives. We, we were part of churches that were very intentional in their accountability, very intentional in community with each other. Um, we reached out to our neighbors. Um, it was just a part of our life. Um, I had told God soon after salvation that I would gladly move to Africa because to me that was like the epitome of like, I don't know, Christianity or something, like Africa. But God instead wanted to teach me how to walk in obedience in the mundane, you know. And um, we were like, what are we here for? Once we pay this farm off, then what, get another farm? I mean, we have enough of boys that we can, you know, give the farms away to them, but what do we want? What is God, what is he calling us to? And in the middle of all this, we get a phone call asking us to move to Africa. I was like, finally, I get to prove to God how much I love him. We sold the farm, sold all our possessions with my father's blessing who lived on the farm. We, we said, we're not leaving unless you give us your blessing. I mean, that sounds like it was very, it wasn't a bait and switch situation. We just said, you know, we shared our hearts and what do you think? And he said, I bless you to go. And we were shocked. And he said, I think you should sell the farm. And this was a farm that my dad had built from the ground up. And we said, are you sure? He said, I believe we had bought it from him. He said, yes. So we pack up our eight children and I was pregnant with baby number nine and we move to Africa. Let's just say I was totally unprepared for that season of life. Hashtag missionary goals took a pretty serious nosedive. Those two years, we served a two year term where we lost a little daughter, our second daughter, Hadassah, to anencephaly, as she had no skull. We found out about a month and a half, two months, two, three months after moving there that she was going to die. There was zero percent chance of of her surviving that, and so we have a little daughter buried in Africa, but yet not really, right? She's with Christ, and she's still a part of our family. Um, and we welcomed yet another son five months before returning to the States. When we got back, I told the Lord, I just have one request. <laughs> I just want a big old white farmhouse in the country. I want some ramshackle barns, maybe a pond or two. Room for my boys to explore, an old farm dog. House full of people. I'll gladly serve you there. But I hate the city. I hated city life in Kenya. We were behind gated compounds, gated walls, guards at the gates. Two weeks after we moved to Africa, our neighbor man, a missionary by the name of Jan, was strangled with a metal wire. Um, the, the cops caught the murderers, brought them into the front yard, just a bush over from our house, and executed them all in the back of the head. That night, the widow of this missionary who was killed, uh, who, she was a native Kenyan. It was sadly a divorce and remarriage situation. She invited the missionaries over to sing. And as we walked past that blood-soaked ground, I told God, why would you bring us to this place? Why? I came to Africa to tell people about Jesus, and instead, I am traumatized. And I hate this city. I hate living here. Um, we discovered later that the people, the locals, were convinced that the, the wife of this missionary was actually behind the murder because she wanted his, his money. And um, be that as it may, those two years were very needed in my life. So sometimes when God asks you to do something very hard, it doesn't go anything at all like you imagined. It's not because he made a mistake. But it's because there's a work he wants to do in your life. And I went over there with these huge goals. I was going to be the best missionary ever. I mean, I was just going to be holding Bible studies left and right. <laughs> I never mind I had a whole house full of children. I mean, they would be fine. But, um, you know, I didn't hold a single Bible study. You know what I did? I served rice and beans to family after family after family that came through. Other missionary families, friends and family from America, which was awesome. 
And at the end of those two years, as we were getting ready to leave, I sat in that rocking chair rocking my baby, and I said, God, I have failed you so terribly. I haven't led a single soul to Christ. What have I done for you? I've done nothing but shovel food in people's mouths, so to speak. I've babysat, and I've, we've had times of rich, rich fellowship. Our compound, all the missionaries lived within uh, just, you know, we each had our own private house, gated, but all within one big compound. So it was like a big family. Um, and it was a lot of work hosting, but at the same time, we had so much rich fellowship, and I loved that part of it. But I said, I didn't do anything for you. And he, I just remember so clearly, he, was, he, he spoke into my heart, you did exactly what I called you to do. You did what I told you to. So we moved back, and like I said, I said, I, I just, I just want to live. I just want to rest, heal, serve Jesus in the middle of nowhere, raise my boys, and then I'll go anywhere you want. And then we got a phone call from a certain brother who lives in Boston, whose last name, whose, whose last name starts with Carew and ends with Villa. <laughs> Finney Carew Villa. And for those of you that know Brother Finney Carew Villa, he is not the kind of guy that calls to have some lighthearted chit chat. And he said, I would like to meet with you and your family. And I'm like, are you kidding me? And so at the next Kingdom Fellowship weekend, which was not long after that, we sat down with Laura and Finney, and he said they're looking at doing a church plant at that time in Kentucky. And you were tagged as a family that we should ask to pray about serving there. Um, we had learned to know Charlton and Natasha Swayze while we were in Africa. They're, they are still some of our dearest friends. Um, but they, are, they, are serving, they were serving at that time under the Followers of the Way mission in Uganda. And um, <clears throat> he said that it was through him that we were um, introduced to Followers of the Way. Let's just say, long story short, instead of a white farmhouse, I found myself on a first floor apartment in Boston with another family of 12 living above us. So get this, we're in the city. There's me, my husband, 10 children. No, I was pregnant with number 10. I was pregnant with a ninth boy on the first floor. And above us was a family with 10 children. And I, when we went to visit them, before we did, made our final decision, I, I, I asked these families, how do you survive? Because this is insane. Who would do this willingly? I mean, I'm trying to be all respectful and kind here, but you people are crazy. Like, how do you do this with your children? And they all kind of looked at me and said, we're still trying to figure it out. And I said, well, a lot of help you are, but you know what? If God is calling us to live in the city, I had told him I would go anywhere. And our family, uh, my husband and I, um, my husband, one thing that he, a decision he made years ago as the leader of the family is that we make no big decisions that is not united as a couple. Doesn't mean that we aren't terrified but it means that we are united. And now that we have older children, we bring them into that journey, which has been interesting also. Has been amazing, but it's, it's a, yeah. So we ended up in Boston. My husband was a newly appointed director of a newly founded immigrant center under Followers of the Way. And the second day we got there, it was a snowstorm hit the city. And I'm sitting in my chair and I'm looking out over the, the, the city and all I see is, you wanna guess what I'm seeing? Houses. All around me, house after house after house. And I'm like, dear God, what have you done to us? What are we doing here? Fortunately for us, we quickly fell in love with city life. Boston is a beautiful city. It will always have a special place in our hearts no matter where we move on from, from here. Um, we fell in love with Boston and I became a very passionate city dweller and advocate for any person serious about being a fisherman for Jesus to move into the city, which brings me to my first point. And for what it's worth, these are, my, these are my personal opinions, so take them with a grain of salt, okay? This is not gospel truth. But these are some things that have helped me survive in the city. These are some things that other women have done and are doing that have been very encouraging. And I wanna hear from all of you, whether you live in the city or not, I want to hear from you as a mother what has helped you parent well. Um, because a lot of those things can be applied whether you live urban or country. So I believe, point number one, that 
living urban is a calling. Just like living in you know, Timbuktu or China, or you know, if, you would, if you would move to Mongolia, you would say, I feel called to move there, right? I believe it needs to be the same, no matter where you live, it's a calling. So living in the city needs to be a calling. You need to be able to own that calling when it gets really hard, because it will. It's gonna be challenging. Um, something that my husband and I have noticed, I think it's human nature, but we tend to think that location will turn a person into an amazing warrior for Christ. All you need to do is find that perfect spot and kaboom, you are, like, you've got it. And so whenever a new and exciting opportunity presents itself, we're all about it. And then we wake up and discover that if we haven't been witnessing for Jesus in the middle of nowhere, you're not going to be doing it in the city either. You are the same person in the city that you are in the country. And just for the record, I know of people that are more effective in the country than people that live urban. I'm not saying that to discourage those of you who are praying about moving to urban life. I love urban living. It is very rich, and there's so many amazing things about it. But I know people who live, and I know, I'm know i thinking of one situation right now. They're a family that lives in, in the country, and they, they have a heart for the lost. They've always had a heart for people. And they started praying, well, where, where are people that we can reach out to? We live in the country, and they're praying about actually moving closer to the city. But God has not opened those doors. They have been looking for houses and looking, and everything keeps falling through. So they're like, well, as long as we're here, where are those people? What's been amazing is seeing how God is opening those doors. They are, have built a, a friendship with a rabbi and his wife. They're bringing them into their home. They're discussing scripture. They've made friends with a Muslim and his family. They're bringing them into their home, discussing scripture, and just doing life together. Just like my husband said this morning, sitting around the table, sharing life. They need to see you laugh. I, they need to sometimes see you cry. They need to see you be human, not some kind of spiritual gurus that are way up here where no one, you know, their, their lives are a mess, a lot of them. And, and if you have this persona of like, no, we have all the answers. No, they need to see you be human. And then they need to see Jesus step in and minister to you. And they'll go, what's different about you when you go through hard times than when I go through hard times? You know, we tell our children that if God calls them to the back 40, they better obey, because there may be some lost soul in the back of a field lane that needs to hear the gospel. Urban living is not my religion. Jesus is. I just, I'm excited about all these urban groups happening, but I, I worry sometimes for all the urban mamas, because it's, 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 it's not necessarily always easy and I want to see you guys, I want to see the, the mothers who are going, that you own this with your husband, that this is where God is calling us. Because those times when you wonder if you're crazy, you need to know, you need to be able to go back and say, no, I know he called us here. So how do we, how do we move forward? I love the verse in 2 Corinthians 16, 9 that says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro over all the earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts are fully devoted to him. That's in the Berean Study Bible. And let me assure you, if God calls you to urban living, especially with a house full of children, never mind boys, you're going to need God to show himself strong. Which brings me to point number two. I'm sorry, this feels like it's being a little negative at first, but just hold on. Urban living while raising children is hard. So I think back to when we lived on the farm. My children, if those of you who live in the country now, who lived in the country where you were raising your family, my children lived outside. Like literally in the summertime, my living room and the toys barely got used. They were outside creating, they were building. Um, they had whole villages built back behind the barns where I couldn't see the mess, you know? I love that about the, the country. They went swimming and ice skating on our pond and built forts in the woods. They threw three foot long weeds, and I'm not exaggerating at each other from my garden. I never inherited the Mennonite gift of gardening. Um, I've often wished I did, but I tried. I gave it a good shot, but life was crazy on the farm and I just never got around to it. My children enjoyed it though. They enjoyed the, the weed throwing and the, the, the games that they would play in, in among the weeds. They learned science through butchering chickens and pigs and all that kind of stuff, raising our own meat. And this is where I'm reminded where I love urban, why I love urban living so much. I'm just happy to go to the grocery store. <laughs> it's where my oldest son says he learned to enjoy hard work. So why would we trade that for a city yard? 
Well, we traded the safe and the easy, easy, because we felt he was calling. We traded the safe and the comfortable because we felt he was calling, but that doesn't mean that it's easy. Just because God calls you to do something, we have this assumption that if God calls us to do something, it's going to be easy, or at least it's all gonna fall into place, and it's gonna look a certain way, and make us feel a certain way, and that's not exactly how it is. In fact, there's a very real possibility that you will face serious opposition if you're walking in obedience. It may be from family who think you're crazy. It may be from grouchy new city neighbors who think you're in a cult, no kidding. We lived in Boston, and I, I don't blame the neighbors. I mean, take a good look at us. 12 people upstairs, 12 people downstairs. We look weird, we act weird, we have a lot of children. We used the street, it was a one-way street, and this was the, the first place we moved to in Boston was probably one of the most ideal city living situations, at least for us, because the, the, the street going by our house was a one-way street. It was not a through street where people would go, you know, they would just come in our street to go home. And so the city put a children playing sign up, and my children literally used that street as their playground. I mean, street hockey and basketball and skateboarding and you name it, they played it there in that street, um, along with their 10 friends from upstairs. And one day I'm walking down the street, and the neighbor man, he is a true Bostonian, I won't even try to mimic the, the, the accent, but he comes up to me, he says, can I ask you a question? And I said, sure, I'm, I'm ready to tell him about Jesus. You know, he's like, who are you people? I was like, seriously, we're not creepy. <laughs> I know it looks, it looks a little weird. This is not polygamy or anything like that going on here. And I just said, well, we're, we're just simple followers of Jesus Christ. We're Christians, and we are, you know, we are just here to tell people about Christ. And he's like, okay. He walked off. <laughs> Thankfully, most grouchy neighbors can be won over with a friendly smile, and I've learned a little trick. It's called homemade donuts, or make it cookies or whatever. Most of your grouchy neighbors can be won over. Point number three, prepare yourself. If you feel God calling you to the city, prepare yourself, just like you would if you were moving to a foreign field. Research the city that you feel you're being called to. Find out where the parks are and the splash pads and the science museums and the libraries. You know, in Providence, I don't know if this is in a lot of cities, I know it is in Boston, they have these amazing splash pads. And the nice thing is it's all mamas with their little children. You're not thinking about, you know, you're not gonna be seeing teenagers in bikinis or anything like that. These are like just little children running around. My little ones love the splash pad. It's also a great opportunity to strike a conversation with people, because we're watching our children. And if you're like me, you're in the splash pad with your children. And you know, it's just a great time. Research the homeschooling laws. laws. Equip yourself to move there. Pray about finding a house with a yard so that you can have a sandbox for littles, even just a tiny little turtle sandbox. And if you're comfortable with a trampoline, invest in one. I, I feel like if we, we, we should have invested in a few more things like that when we moved to Boston, maybe a nice, sw a decent swing set. Um, my husband was a little nervous about the trampoline with so many children, understandably. Um, but invest in some of those things for your little children. If gardening is therapeutic for you, then ask God for a yard big enough to have some raised beds. If you're like me and need therapy at the thought of a garden in the city, ask God to show you where the closest coffee shop is. <laughs> Here's the thing, God cares about you and he cares about your desires. I mean, obviously that doesn't mean he always gives us exactly what we think we want. And somehow, I don't know, I think for me, I tend to think sometimes it's not spiritual to ask God for some of these little things, you know. it's it's. But when we moved to Providence, where we live now, something that Emily and I both actually asked God for, that was that there would be a, a nice little downtown area walkable from us. And we're like, God, you don't have to give that to us, but we would just love that. And that's exactly what we got. We got this beautiful coffee shop just down the street from us, um, a sweet little downtown. We've gone for many walks over the neighborhood. It's a small thing. It doesn't have an eternal impact necessarily, but God delights in treating his children take those desires to him and then practice contentment with where you're at. If he doesn't give that, that's okay. He'll give you something else, something better maybe, or something different. Um, but yeah, ask him. Number four, get creative. Now, I know there are some mothers here who are very creative. <laughs> they love doing crafts with their children. There are the ones who are always doing this amazing stuff. I struggle in this area. 
I would, would prefer reading a book, to be honest. Um, I struggle with the create, creative side. However, my boys do not. Which is why my backyard has looked like a refugee camp more often than not. You give them a couple old pallets, some hammers, some nails. They've created forts and mini villages, and my husband will he'll leave for a couple of days on a business trip or something, come back, and he'll go, what is that in the backyard? And I'm like, well, the children. <laughs> they even planted a garden one time <clears throat> that took one look at its surroundings and promptly died. <laughs> Seriously, it did. It was like, there ain't no way this is going anywhere. <laughs> They're like, Mom, I don't understand. My, my, my stuff is dying. And I'm like, oh, it's too bad. <laughs> but they tried. So I don't know, try, try some like mint or something. That supposedly that does very well in the, in the city. But, but you know, every so often I say enough is enough. And revival sweeps through the land and we clean the dump up. <laughs> Just long, usually when there's people coming. <laughs> I'm embarrassed to admit, usually when there's guests coming or people without boys and I'm like, Marlon, we really, sh this, this looks really bad, and I can't take it anymore. I, I have a little, I hate mess. Like I said earlier, I don't like clutter, and I, I, you know what? I forgot to tell God that when he gave me 10 children, 10 boys. But boys especially, ch all children, but I think especially boys need to be able to create. And in their creativeness, you know what's going to happen? Mess and destructiveness kind of comes along with it. She's going to love this, but Evelyn is one who is my hero when it comes to her backyard. She doesn't actually have as big of a yard as I do, right? Your yard is a bit smaller. But not only does she have beautiful raised beds, I'm telling you what is possible in the city. If you're creative, and this is something that you can make happen. She has beautiful raised beds where each of her children have their own, right? And they also have a wonderful treehouse with a slide. I'll be honest. Well, let me just finish that. Not only do they have a wonderful treehouse with a slide, did you want to know what's at the end of that slide? Every child's dream, well, that might be a pool, not that, a ball pit. And when I saw that, I'm not going to lie, I went home and I was just a little jealous, and I was also a little mad at my men that they didn't build my boys something so amazing. I'm like, this is, this, this is amazing, and I'm just, that is not my gifting. But you know what? Learn from other women who are doing the city. Talk to someone like Evelyn if you want to learn how to take a small space and make it creative for children. I'm talking that right now, more younger children. My big kids don't really want to go in the ball pit. But, <laughs> but for children, you know, it doesn't take that much space. Just, just be creative, and that is a, one of the weaknesses I feel like I, I just have failed in this area, which is why I felt like I shouldn't even be up here sharing. I said, that's something I haven't done as well for my children. They've created their own ball pit type stuff. But think ahead about that. Like, if you're going to be moving urban, think about that. Do some research. I mean, we have the internet nowadays. Go on and find ways to keep young children that they can have, have your backyard be a, a haven for them. Um, they even have a, a tire swing, which is amazing. Not everyone's going to have a yard like that. <clears throat> but if you do, and if that is something that you are, want to do, you can do it. Do you want to know what I've had in my backyard for the last number of months? Not a ball pit, not a cute tire swing or a pretty raised bed, a 50 passenger coach. <laughs> no, we did turn it into a chicken coop, although it probably would have been a good idea. We do have a pretty big city yard, but an old Mennonite church bus that my husband has the vision to turn into an RV for our family. Something that he had this dream for years. And I wonder where my boys get their creativity, right? Um, this is something he's talked about for years. And I've always been like, that's a nice idea, honey. Sure. It'll never happen. And it did happen. We found a bus, thanks to a, a brother in the Lord who was getting rid of it for a good price. And Marlon's like, what do you think? And I was like, do you really want to know what I think? Or is this where I should start submitting? <laughs> And so I, I did a little research, and I'm like, oh, you know what? They actually could be kind of cool, and it's been my husband's dream for years to take the whole family before they leave home and, and just do a trip of the United States. Well, a regular camper isn't going to hold our family, not even a big camper, and we couldn't even afford those if we wanted those. So that's what's been residing in my backyard. Someday we'll go on this trip when the price comes down and we can afford to go further than five miles, right? Um, 
So we've had neighbors walking by and doing like stopping and looking. We've had literally neighbors taking cameras out and like click, 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 click. The ice cream man with his ice cream chuck comes screeching to a halt one day and my children get running out and they're like, I want to buy your bus someday. And I'm like, you can have it. <laughs> no. Um, but here's the thing. One of the reasons my husband has wanted to do that bus thing is because it would also give a project that him and his boys could work on together. And it, it's a little messy. I'm not going to lie. It's been a little messy. But the Lord did a work in my heart that needed done in the area of sanctification and following my husband's dreams, even if they weren't always necessarily mine, because I have learned something in 26 years of marriage. When your husband has a dream to do something, just bless him in it and go with it. I've never regretted that. Actually, we have made some of our best family memories. I am more of a, let's stay inside our comfort zone a little more, and my husband's like, hey, let's do this. Um, and I've never regretted it, never. But my point is this. If your heart's desire is a Lancaster-style um, yard where every blade of grass stands at attention, move to Lancaster. <laughs> because grass is not going to survive in a yard where there's a lot of little feet. Any of you that are feeling depressed about your yard, just come to my house. <laughs> there is literally a dirt path around my house where these little boys ride their trikes day after day. And when we first moved there, I said, we killed the grass in the other two yards that we lived in before in the city. This grass is going to survive. And I finally gave up. I said, you know what? That's not fair to my children. I bring them to the city. Let them ruin the grass with their tricycle. There's got to be a way somewhere, somehow around that. I don't know. Uh, one of the, the brothers from Boston, he actually paved a trail around their house. And I thought that was a brilliant idea. So I've been trying to rack my brains how we could do that. But yeah, I have had to swallow my pride over and over, especially when you go to the local gas station and this New Englander standing behind the, the counter and she's like, to my boys, she's like, oh, you guys aren't in school today. And they're like, well, we're finished. Oh, well, then that means you have more time to clean up your yard. And I was like, are you serious? <laughs> You're telling me to clean up my yard? And I kind of looked at her and I was like, wow, people in the New England states really are forthright. And um, anyway, and I, I went home and I went storming him to my husband and I said, this is ridiculous. People are looking at our yard. We're supposed to be telling them about Jesus. We could at least put a gospel sign out front. And instead they're going by and it's not even that bad. They haven't even seen trash yet. You know, and, um, but it did keep, keep us motivated to keep that yard a little more cleaned up. I mean, seriously, it's not a trash heap, but it's a little messy. But the thing is, I want my boys to be able to express their creativity. I don't want them to grow up saying, Mom was always an angry wretch because she wanted a perfect yard. I want them to be able to say we had space and time to build and create. So you may need to sacrifice your yard for that or just utilize it a little better than what I have. Speaking of creative, we have friends that live on the top floor of an apartment building. I don't know. How many floors are on Malden Towers? I don't know. 10, 10 floors, and they live on the very 10th floor. And outside, on their apartment outside, is like this concrete patio. You can like look out over the city. Don't worry, there's a wall. They're safe. And um, what they've done up there is actually put a kiddie pool, fill it with water. And there's several other families from the church that live in this apartment building, and they have a standing invitation for the church families to bring their children up to play in the kiddie pool. The last I was there, they also had like a little sandbox up there. Excellent idea. Not only that, it, it fosters community, uh, which is something that's also important if you live in the city, is a sense of community. Um, they also, I think, were the family that had a rope swing in their living room. And I suggested that to my husband. You can imagine what he said, no. He said, boys and rope swings in the living room were gonna have holes in the wall. And I was like, well, wouldn't it kind of be worth it? I'm the one here dealing with all this energy, right? All right, point number five. Oi. All right. Utilize the things that only a city can offer. For me, it is one of the perks about city life. Now, I love the energy of the city, the vibe, the bustle, the hustle, the people. I'm curious about people. Love to watch people. And I've discovered that most people are very friendly if you are friendly. If you smile at them, most people, and if you can make people in the New England state smile, you can make people smile anywhere. You know, they tend to be a little more, they have that reputation. They'll, they'll tell you like, it, like, like they see it. It is true. But I have found them to be very friendly. Be excited about the city opportunities. Um, like I mentioned before, libraries, museums, the aquarium, zoos, 
the cities we've been lived in have had a lot of walking spaces, biking spaces. Um, one year we bought a family pass to the science center. Never mind that our children got thoroughly sick of going. Every time someone came to visit us, we'd be like, do you guys want to go to the science museum? And after a while, our children are like, no, we don't want to go there anymore. But we made a lot of great memories, nevertheless. They had a great IMAX, very educational. It's a little expensive. But for us, with our size family, it was actually cheaper to buy a one year pass than it was just to go a couple times. And then we would rearrange with other large families. So when guests came, we would all have enough of passes to get in. It worked out great. Um, <clears throat> most cities have children museums. So much fun for your younger ones. In Boston on Friday evenings from five to eight, Target sponsors it for $1 per person. So being the frugal Anabaptist that we are, we would choose to go Friday afternoons from at five o'clock, be there before the crowd happens. <laughs> and we had so much fun. We'd spend our money on ice cream afterwards, but um, it was hours of fun for the children. And because we live near the ocean, we have found fairly private beaches. They aren't as pretty as some of the public beaches, but they're a lot less filled with naked people too. So um, I have a daughter who loves to take her siblings into her. Um, she takes her responsibility very serious for being an older, sibling to her younger children and she loads them all up and takes them to the beach and they have hours of fun playing in that water and um, it's, a, it's amazing. Um, to be honest though, in many ways, thinking about younger children, raising younger children in the city isn't really that much different than raising them in the country. Um, you know, <clears throat> household chores happen the same, Legos, books, lots and lots of books, walks to the park, all those things. We even have a dog in the city I'm not an animal lover. I think they're cute from a distance. But we do have a little family dog, and she um, has given our boys, one of the reasons we got her, well, there was a couple of reasons. One is, um, you know, puppies. It helps with the cost, offset the cost of city living. Um, but the other thing was to give our boys responsibility. And it is good for them, even if we live in the city, to get their hands in the dirt. If you do, you know, let them have their own little raised bed or, or um, it's good for them to experience nature. You don't want to box them off into concrete jungles. You want them to experience nature, whether it's going to the parks a lot. Um, but for us, having a dog where um, they could see the cycle of life and, you know, she had puppies and they got to watch these puppies being born and they also got to watch, well, um, the facts of life. Um, it's an excellent teaching opportunity on so many levels to have a family dog, and, and she's, been, she's been a real gift. Um, get a couple of electric scooters. That's something that we have on our to-do list, is get a couple of electric scooters and, and go around the city with some of your children. Take them out on a little scooter date. Now, downtown Providence has scooters that you can rent. I think most cities probably do anymore. Um, so much fun. The children love that. Or we would have some in the middle age that would be old enough to go alone. As soon as they know how to handle crosswalks and creepy people, we let them go explore the city within reason. But, you know, take their scooters, they can take their scooters around. Um, but for us personally, my little ones are the easier side of living in the city. It's a little harder when you have the tween and the teen years coming along. And um, <clears throat> that's what I'm going to talk about next is number six, what to do with teens. And I am more convinced than ever that as parents, you know, after experiencing the whole age range in the city, <clears throat> it's important that our teens have a purpose. And I mentioned that before. And it's something that we're still figuring it out. But there are opportunities if you're willing to think outside the box. I don't know. I grew up, most of us, we lived in an area where there were Mennonite businesses. So if we needed a job, we went to a Mennonite business and got a job. And that was great. What do you do in the city when there's no Mennonite businesses around? What do you do when you have a 14-year-old that needs a purpose? We've been very blessed. About 30 minutes from our house is um, a Mennonite produce farmer, and he actually has hired our twins the last two summers to help out with picking tomatoes, and that has been a huge gift. But I also understand that's kind of the exception to the rule. Our children have volunteered at a food pantry. Um, that's something they really enjoyed. It's also an excellent way to get into the community. Obviously, don't let your young 12, 13-year-olds go by themselves. We always have it paired up, have them paired up with an older sibling. 
um, <clears throat> or if you don't have an older sibling yourself or your husband or maybe a trusted church friend that is going to be volunteering and they can, they'd be happy to take your 12 year old with them once or twice a week. Our boys have also mowed lawns for neighbors. They go around, they've made homemade signs and, or not signs, homemade pamphlets, whatever, and go around and give their, my, my name and number uh, to the neighbors to mow the lawns and to you know, rake lawns. In the winter, they, they shovel snow for the neighbors. Um, something we have discovered, and this is, one of the, this is an excellent ministry tool because people don't see children working anymore. I've heard this, the postman one day said, I love coming by your house. There's always someone outside. And I'm like, well, do you know how many people are crammed in our house? But he said, you know, I don't see this anymore. He said, I, I go all over the city and I don't see children outside playing anymore. They're all inside gaming. People love to see that. One, one, some, one winter after a snowstorm, our boys were going around shoveling snow. And, you know, I mean, they're, they like to make a little money on the side. This is how they earn it. Like my husband says, like little, good little capitalists. Um, but it, they don't give an amount. They just say to people, whatever you feel you can give. Um, but one day um, after a snowstorm and they were around shoveling, my husband and I were getting ready to leave somewhere and this car pulls up and this neighbor stops. This lady uh, pulls her, cranks her window down and she's like, hey, are you the parents of the, the young boys that were um, shoveling snow? And we're like, yeah. Did they do something bad? And she's like, I just want to tell you that that's amazing. That's amazing to see young boys want to go out and work like that. What an opportunity to just, it, it, it's just something different, you know? There's something different about children that are willing to work. Our boys have gone into woodworking and gotten out of it again. But if someone is motivated, you can sell it on Etsy or Facebook Marketplace. Just be careful. We all know the dangers, right, of internet use. Um, we also have friends who has a, who have a son who does small engine repair. Now they have a little bigger yard, and you, so you're going to have to have a certain size for this. But he is that busy he can't keep up. Just neighbors bringing over these small engines to repair. Excellent city opportunity for your boys, and it's also an excellent way to reach your neighbors, to reach the community. When we moved to Boston, one of our sons loved fishing. And um, we gave him the knowledge of how to be careful, what, who to look out for, who to run away from, and left him go. Now, he was probably about 13. He usually went with a friend, and they didn't go miles away, but they would hop on the tee and go down to the water somewhere, or they would walk. There was a 2,000-acre nature preserve just walking distance from our house, and they would go to the nature reservoirs and go fishing. And it was, you know, all things that helped to fulfill their time and make them feel like they were... Um, you have to get to a certain place of trust with your children. Um, obviously, we're not sending our eight-year-old out alone. But as they get older, hopefully, ideally, you have that relationship with them, that you can have some really hard conversations, what to watch for, what to look for in people. Uh, we, uh, we have our middle sons love making homemade movies and editing them and then showing them to us. They've learned... Um, typing through an online program called NitroType where they can actually race against friends. Some of them have become very good typers with very little effort from me, which has been amazing. Um, but there again, you're running the risk. So we always keep our, our main computer is in the main part of the house. It's heavily filtered, passworded, and they're not allowed to use it unless some of us are, are you know, just walking around there and that kind of a thing. Um, so use discretion. Something else that people need help with is walking their dogs. Um, that's another, actually, business opportunity for teenagers is dog walking. We've talked about doing that. Um, one of the things I think is amazing is when I hear people that live in the city whose sons can go work with their dad. Um, that, is, that is very ideal, because I feel like in the evenings there's plenty of things you can find to do, um, whether it's something as a family or if your children have... Um, projects they like to work on, work on. My 22-year-old son is, we call him an old soul, and he loves to restore old vintage cars, which also adds to the beauty of my backyard. <laughs> but he has an old 1970-something Mercedes uh, he bought from an Italian guy. Actually, he had traded the vehicle. He had another old car that they switched out. And um, he has taken it down to literally, he's restoring it from the engine to the floorboard, like literally restoring it inside out. 
Um, and I stand there in amazement, both at his capability, but also at the mess, but he does really well cleaning up. Um, but encourage your children to find what, what, you know, not just things that they enjoy doing with their hands. You know, we're all about sharing the gospel, but we also enjoy doing something productive. Um, that's something that has been amazing, amazing for them. One of my older sons has one of those electric unicycle type things. I don't know, they're kind of new. Um, it doesn't even have a seat, but he zooms all over the city on that thing. Um, he wears a helmet. Our city also has outdoor skating, something to look for. A lot of cities have either outdoor skating and they even often have homeschool days at the skating rinks where it's either free or greatly reduced. Um, you can get to meet other homeschoolers and your children can skate to their heart's content. Our boys have become phenomenal skaters because in the winter time, this is one way they can work off energy. Actually, they built such a relationship with the skate guards at our local outdoor skating rink in downtown Providence that last winter, the skate guards gave them free family passes for the whole family, which was worth a couple hundred dollars at least. Um, and our boys went almost every night. And our older sons, especially our oldest son, built friendships with some of the young men there. And one of the things that I think is important, um, <clears throat> the temptation is to want to keep our children in this bubble, right? We want to just protect them. And we do want to, and that's good, especially when they're young. We need to. We are their protection. But as they get older, you have to start releasing them. They need to see the real world out there. You need to be a safe place so they can talk about that real world. But our older children have made some pretty interesting connections. Eric, our oldest son, as he learned to know some of these young men that would come every often when he was there, and he would talk about their, their struggles they were going through. And they would all sit out there in the skating rink and talk. He was like, man, these children, I mean, these young people, these young men have a hard life. One of them lost an adopted father over that time. Um, Eric was going to go to the funeral service, but then discovered that it was a closed service just for the immediate family. Um, but what an opportunity for our young people to reach out. They need to be a part of this mission field. They need to be involved and interactive. It's not just about us being missionaries. It's about our family. Number seven, protecting our children in the city. One of the misconceptions that we came up against when we informed my um, horror-stricken family that we're moving to the city with all these children was the, was the idea that around every street corner is going to be a drug dealer or a prostitute. That hasn't been the case for us. Actually, I have dear family members who have been involved in those things living in the country. Um, it is a possibility. I mean, it is absolutely, you're going to see some very strange things for sure. Um, but we have the idea that these people are just lurking around the corner waiting to, you know, corrupt our children's spotless souls. Well, your children's souls aren't that spotless. They have the sin nature. Um, so for us, from day one, after we got saved and started, God started developing a vision for children, for a vision for our family, um, we have decided to take a very frank and open approach to our children about life, about the facts of life, and about how Satan takes something beautiful and he twists it and makes it into something so ugly. We haven't, we've, we've tried to, um, I mean, we all hate the idea of having to tell our children what to watch for with sexual abuse um, and any of those kinds of things. But we also want our children to see the brokenness that's around us. That's why we're there. How can they see the transformation that Jesus brings if we never allow them to see the ugly? For example, down the street from us lives a young man. Well, I think he's a man. And I was, we were um, babysitting some dear friends of ours children one day they were on the mom and dad were away on a little little getaway and me and emily and <clears throat> this sweet young 18 year old was sitting out on the front stoop we have this little like three steps or whatever and just sitting there and this dear friend she's she's from africa and she's like all of a sudden she gets this look of horror in her face and she says mama darla i think there's a naked lady coming down the street and i'm like what and i'm like where and she's like down there. And I'm like, I've just about, I've seen almost naked, but not quite. And here comes this poor young man walking down the street. Um, he tends to wear flowing skirts. 
and little halter tops with a shadow beard, carrying his little pocketbook. Except today, he had a shirt that was hanging open. He was clearly taking hormone drugs. And um, that's the reality of the world that we are living in. And it's, you're gonna see more of it in the city, but it's, it's everywhere. And I am convinced that the, the, the worst thing to do is to build 10 foot walls, so to speak, around our family and just pretend that doesn't exist. These are the people that Jesus came for. And, but for the grace of God, that would be me. It wasn't me that chose to be born into a Christian family. It wasn't them that were chosen to be born, that chose to be born in a situation where something was so terribly wrong. And when we see those kind of people, that should make, move our hearts to a deep compassion. The eyes of Jesus is what I want. I've tried to get that young man to say hi to me. I've tried to, I would love to just chat with him. Just, hey, how are we? and he will not. It's so, it's so interesting. We've noticed that every time he comes by our house, and, and if we're out there, he, and he quickly gets on his phone and starts talking on the phone. And he, he sees us and he thinks, you know, religious freaks are going to hate me. And I'm like, no, I don't hate you. I want to see you get set free. What, what happened in your life to make you so broken inside? But our children, it's a, they need to be equipped on how to process these kinds of situations. And so we need to, as parents, as moms, have that relationship with them where we can discuss the kind of broken situations that we see all around us. It's not a thing of, what a loser. That's not the kind of attitude that I think is healthy. We want the kind of attitude that is redemptive and that goes, that poor, poor man. I think he's a man, but yeah, we see them. Men wearing high heels, and it's 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 really it's really 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 heartbreaking. However, we are still called to protect our families and to be wise. So, what does that look like? How do you protect your children? I mean, obviously, I can't tell you exactly what to do. Ask the Holy Spirit to guide your family. He's capable of that. He's capable of writing your heart. For us as a family, we have a few basic guidelines. We're not really big on a whole list of do's and don'ts. We we are very big on relationship discussing these things, um, but the ones that we do have, we, we make sure to make clear to our children why we have these expectations and why. I mean, I'm not going to let you go out downtown by yourself as a 15-year-old late at night because there's very likely going to be, you know, drug deals or who knows what. Now, if you're with an older siblings, you know, the older children are, are different. We, you know, they're, they've reached a level of maturity. And when they get to a certain age, well, if their heart is bent on destruction, they're going to go that path no matter what kind of rules you have set in place. So there comes a time and a place as a parent that you've got to release them to God. That doesn't mean that you don't pray and that you don't have hard conversations, but it means that you no longer tell them what to do like you would a child. But for our younger children, um, we have a few basic guidelines. If you're like our 10 and 12 year old, um, cannot go to the library by themselves. Our library is within walking and biking distance, which is amazing. Um, but they have to go together as a team and they have to stay together. Um, our 14 year olds, they can go alone. Now our children, we do not have them go in looking for books by themselves because I know some libraries may be a little different, but the libraries where we live are really bad, like the, the teen section. And our boys don't even want to go in there. There's just nasty all over the place. And so what we do is just order books online and the library gets them in and they know they, they have their own library cards, they go in, they get their books and they come home. They go to, they bike to Family Dollar alone. They know the rules, they know to, you know, I, you know. Children become street savvy pretty quickly as far as just recognizing someone who doesn't feel right. Um, where I get concerned is my little ones. We only have a chain link fence around our property. Our goal was to eventually put in a, a, a tall privacy fence around the back half of the yard so that we could let my little ones run and play without supervision. But for now, my two-year-old is not allowed out in the yard without an older sibling along. Um, just because, you know, would, it wouldn't take much. Would you like a lollipop? Sure, I would like a lollipop. There he goes, you know. No not happening. So he can't be outside without, and that is a sacrifice. It's a sacrifice as a mom. You can't just send them out like that. Even our five-year-old, I, do, I, I don't keep strict rein on him, but um, I thought I was doing a good job on warning him, and then one day I hear that he was at the front gate chatting away with, I don't even know who it was, it's a neighbor. And I, how do you tell a five-year-old, be very careful who you're talking to, because they might steal you. I mean, you don't want to create fear. You don't want to create this, this, 
this attitude and spirit of fear that they're just like paralyzed, but yet you have got to warn your children. And so we just did it very matter of fact. I don't know that we did it right, but we just said very matter of factly, like, listen, you are not allowed to talk to strangers. You're not allowed to talk to anyone at the front gate unless it's like the wangers or, or you know. Other than that, no, you just can't because we don't know these people that well. Um, and he was like, oh, okay. And we're like, we want to protect you. And there are bad people out there that do take children away from their mommies and daddies. And so when you are outside, we ask him to stay mostly in the backyard. I don't know really how well he always, he's usually with his brothers. And um, uh, once they get past the five, six, seven year old stage, you know, we let them in, our, we don't worry about it in our yard. They know the rules. We've talked over and over. You do not go look at someone's puppy in a van or anything like that, you know, it's just not a good idea. If you have neighborhood children who come over to play, and this is something that I think was discussed last year. We talked about neighborhood children. Some mothers, I was really impressed, have their neighborhood children coming over and playing in their yard on a regular basis. That's amazing. I, we don't have many children on our street. It just, uh, we just don't have any. And the ones that we do, there's a couple teens that do live on our street, but as they came by our yard one day, they dropped a few dirty comments. And I'm like, well, those are some children that are not coming into my yard at this point in my life, maybe someday, but uh, to witness to them. But you need to protect your children. So my personal advice is, if you have neighborhood children coming over to play, I would strongly encourage you to have them leave their phones at the door maybe have a phone basket, I think that was suggested maybe last year, or a specified shelf. You know what, I would love to have you come play at my house, but the phone has to stay here. The age that most children are introduced to porn is getting increasingly younger. New research reports that 22% of porn consumption is from children 10 and younger. So don't think that your children are protected just because they're in your backyard. Just have the phones stay somewhere specified, and then if they need to contact their mother or whatever, then they, can, they know where the phone is, but if you want to be on your phone, you have to be in my yard. It's your yard. You have the right and the authority to do that. I would also encourage you to be very careful about leaving your children play unsupervised with neighborhood children. Um, just be there, um, but there again, just have those conversations with your children. What's appropriate, what's not? We don't talk like that, you know? These children are coming from ungodly homes, and they know a lot of really ungodly stuff. It is shocking what little children, what comes out of their mouths anymore. It is uh, stuff that would have been horrifying even 20 years ago now is kind of normal. And so just, if you have young children, I realize that we're, we view the world as our mission field and we're living urban intentionally for a reason, but your children are your first mission field and they're your first priority. So do what it takes to protect them. Warn about perverts and how children are groomed. There again, it's not a fun subject to talk about. And you have to ask God and your husband when you feel the age, the age is appropriate. We start fairly young. Um, just um, when I'm bathing the little children, just, you know, that you never let anyone touch certain areas. You know, I, I, we just discuss it. Just this is normal. They don't even, you know, like, okay. And then I'll sometimes be like, do we ever allow anyone to touch here except, you know, to wash, to touch, and like, except for mommy and daddy, for bath you or the doctor? No. What do you do if someone wants to? I come and tell you. Well, children, that can help, um, but it's still children, little children are still little children. Um, give your children permission to fight back if someone tries to molest them. I think sometimes in our efforts to teach our children to be nice and non-resistant, we have created some very vulnerable children who have no idea what to do if they're approached sexually or with violence. I was a little Mennonite girl, as you can imagine, with my little long pigtails and my little dress, except for the grace of God. I would have been very vulnerable because I was taught to be nice. You're taught to respect authority, and those are good things. Respecting authority is good. But too often children are afraid to speak up or to, to resist if someone tries to do something inappropriate. And something that we have also warned our children, and this has happened to very close family members of mine, that it often it comes from trusted family members. So you have to have these conversations. It's not probably not gonna, it may very well not come from the neighbor man down the street. It could come from inside, but be that as it may, have those conversations with your children in a natural way, as natural as it can be when you're discussing that kind of thing, but 
just discuss it and tell your children, you know, um, I feel like it hasn't ruined the innocence of our children. Would you say that, Emily? Because we've had many of those discussions since you were a little girl. Because we, for every time that you discuss about something bad that could happen, we discuss about the good that, that God has created us with and the beauty of healthy sexuality and how God created our bodies and it's a gift and it's beautiful. But there are people out there that will take advantage of it if they can. So you want to equip your children. Um, and even if, you know, we aren't God, so no matter how well we try to do this, that doesn't mean we always will. And so we have to forgive ourselves when there's times that we have been able to protect them. And God is able to redeem even those situations. I've seen it. I've seen beautiful redemption happening in some very hard situations. Okay, I think I'm gonna quickly scroll down here. Training and disciplining your children. Yep, gotta do that in the city too. Just be a little more careful where you train and discipline. Front yard is probably not a good idea. Um, and last but not least, my husband touched on this this morning, bring the city into your home. Bring the people into your home around your table. Let your children be a part of that experience where you, uh, we've cooked together with our Chinese friends and our Turkish friends and we've gone to Chinese barbecues and somehow something about bringing these children bringing these people into a home where there's children there, these innocent children, and these sometimes not so innocent, sometimes just naughty, um, but bringing them into family. People crave community. They may not know what they're craving in your life. You know, one person told my husband when he was at the immigrant center, they said, there's just something about you that's different. It's like there's this love. And my husband's like, that's Jesus you're feeling. You want people to come into your home and sense Jesus. And you know what? That's going to cost you as far as you're gonna to have to sacrifice time and energy and free time to serve these people. Cause like someone else said, they leave at 10 o'clock at night and your house is still a mess and you're cleaning up and we're all tired and grouchy by then. But you know what? That has an eternal impact on our children to see these people and to sit there around the table and laugh together. And we have a great time. We've had great time with people from all over the world. Uh, it's not, our, my faith in Jesus does not keep me from enjoying these people as friends. That doesn't mean that we're clearly not of the same spirit, but they need to see you be human. They need to see you laugh and talk and be honest and real. We've shared our testimony with many people. Why would you have this many children? Well, we've, had, we've, had, we've asked ourselves those questions too sometimes, but, but because of Jesus, you know? I mean, um, one more little story I wanna give you. If you come up against an angry neighbor, and you probably will, because your children, you know, children, have, they're gifted in breaking things, right? We had this neighbor in, in Bartlett Street, when we had the first apartment we lived in. So, right, remember, we were children playing out in the street all the time, chaos. Neighbor lives across the street. He's not a very friendly man. He wouldn't even hardly smile at us. And I'm like, oh boy, this is not going to be fun. Um, one day, my, hus my husband, my son, is skateboarding, and what does he do? accidentally takes a skateboard into this poor man's ankles. And I'm like, are you kidding me? He's like, my son is like, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. And this man is like, mm. and I'm like, Eric, we're supposed to be telling people about Jesus and you're running into them with skateboards. You have to be more careful. This is a disaster. He hates us. Well, it wasn't too long after that, that one of my bo our boys were playing basketball out in the street or four square or something. You know, remember, these are boys. They're not dainty little girls just bouncing the ball with their dollies. These are boys. And this ball flies across the street and knocks a part of the fence off, breaks it, the fence post top. And our neighbor, of course, is not a very happy camper. <laughs> and we, I, I dragged my, I shouldn't say I dragged my son over there, but I grabbed my son. I'm like, we're going to have to go over and apologize and offer to pay for it. We go over, this man here, he's, I don't know if he's Italian, his language, his English is a little broken. And I'm like, we are just so sorry this happened. I'm so sorry, so sorry. We're going to pay for it. We're going to fix it. Well, of course, Home Depot by that time, the fence was out of date. There was no piece to replace it with, but we managed to find something. We fixed the fence and we always, I, we always tell our children, be friendly. It's hard to tell people about, it's hard to make people even want to hear about Jesus if you're looking all like 
you know, straight-laced and super holy. You want to be friendly. Let the love of Jesus pour out of your life. Smile at people. So, you know, we kept smiling at this dear soul across the street and saying, hi, and he just, you know, little, he started finally waving a little more and a little more and, you know, got a little friendlier and a little friendlier. And then what really took the cake was every winter, the first big snowstorm, it's a family tradition. We make donuts and we hand them out to our neighbors. I mean, who doesn't like warm homemade donuts? And we even take them to the library. We've made grouchy librarians very friendly. They've become friends of the family. Literally, they become, they're sad when we leave. And so anyway, I said, you know who needs donuts is the man across the street. So let's fill a big plate full. And I sent my boys over with the donuts. You know, when we left that apartment, when we moved out, you know, he came over and hugged my boys. That is what just the power of a friendly smile a quick apology when something, when your children do something, don't make excuses for them or, or tell the neighbor his, his fence was pretty dumb anyway, you know, just, no, just apologize, go fix it, take some big goods over, not because you're manipulating them, not because, but because you truly do care and you're there because you're trying to be a witness for Christ. And if you can't reach your neighbors, what kind of a witness are we? And sometimes our neighbors are kind of like our family. They're the hardest to love. And so reach out to your neighbors, be friendly, and let Jesus speak through your life. One more thing I want to say for those of you who are married. Like my husband said this morning, one of the greatest tools there is for the kingdom is a godly family. But for us, those of us who are married and have husbands, love your daddy's children well. Love your children's daddy well. Did I say it backwards? Love your, daddy's children. Love your children's daddy well. Respect him and serve him. Not only if he makes wise decisions, but even if he makes mistakes. Let your children see your love for each other. Laugh together and cry together as a family and bring your children, especially your older ones as they're becoming adults and learning how to be adults, Bring them into decision-making with your husband as a leader and Jesus as your final authority. Be careful to guard your family time. This is a mistake that we made in the beginning. We were working at the bridge. My husband was director of the bridge and um, the immigrant center, and there was just so many lonely people, which is, by the way, another excellent opportunity is ESL centers, English as a second language, excellent fishing pond for the gospel. These people are coming from all over the world. They don't have family. A lot of them come from communities where there is, like back home, where there would have been more of a family community. They're lonely. They are so lonely. Just bring them to your home for a meal. It means so, so much. But be careful to still guard your family time. We became so busy for the kingdom that our children finally said, enough. We want mom and dad too. We tried to involve our children, but even if you bring, if you bring someone into your home several nights a week, that gets exhausting. They want to have time to hang out with mom and dad around the living room, and they want to be ministered to. They need to be. I want to be ministered to. So, you know, like, make sure you guard that time with your family. Don't get so caught up in doing good things, amazing things, that your children feel like they're left out in the dark. Even if you bring them into being, the mission, like being a part of the mission, just make sure that you have time alone as a family. The goal of a family living in the city isn't to be the perfect family, but it's to glorify God and be the hands and feet of Jesus. Seek him, know him, and give him full authority to take you anywhere, anytime. It's a crazy way to live and sometimes downright terrifying, but God is a faithful God full of mercy and tenderness. He cares less about you doing it perfectly and cares more about the posture of your heart. So. Go with him in confidence.